And let's move on to introduce our very special guest speaker. Um, I'd like, on a personal note, to recommend something that I only came across recently, which is a, a textbook that Michael wrote and very generously provided for free online, which is the best damn foundations of mathematical statistics textbook I have ever come across. And those of you who understand the value of knowing mathematical statistics have probably wrestled with mathematical statistics texts that say things like, here's a sigma algebra, take it or leave it. Now let's talk about what we're going to do with it when you have no idea why. Well, uh, Michael took issue with this, so he, he doesn't shy away from the, uh, the deeper pure mathematical concepts like point set topology, projections, uh, and even Lebesgue integrals. But he explains what they're for. He tells you why you need them. <laughs> he tells you why they're useful, and it makes a huge difference. Also, the, the illustrations are amazing. They're very well placed. So, uh, as someone with an incredible insight and ability to communicate the key aspects of this very, very difficult to some field of statistics, Michael is brilliant. So, a little bit about Michael. Um, uh, I didn't realize that his PhD is in particle physics till I asked him about five minutes ago. I knew it was in physics. I knew it was in physics, but I always thought it was some wonderful combination of differential geometry on the one hand and statistical mechanics on the other hand because that would be the natural combination that leads one to become a Bayesian's Bayesian and someone who knows the intricacies of the differential geometry of Ham Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. But no, he says, no, no, I, I learned all that differential geometry later so I can do Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So, you know, he's done his time as a particle physicist. He became a differential geometer and, of course, what, what, what his current passion is now is as as, as a Bayesian statistician and the, the member of the STAN team. For those of you who don't know, STAN is the probabilistic programming, Bayesian probabilistic programming tool to use. You know, uh, Bugs is so 1999. Um, but STAN, at the heart of STAN, the thing that makes STAN so amazingly fast is the, is the is the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algorithm with a bunch of tricks like uh, no U-turn and a bunch of other stuff I don't understand, but Michael's nodding, it's not that hard. Um, so what, I'm, what we've got here is someone who has contributed to one of the most useful things out there at the cutting edge of data science, a very knowledgeable and very generous person who I think has uh, already added so much to anybody in the room who uses Stan or read his books or seen his presentations. Um, I am so happy that he's giving a prescient course over the next three days in Bayesian inference in Stan. Over to you, Mike. Cheers. Okay. Uh, so it, it's not quite a book yet. It's, it's chapters. They're kind of going that direction. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff online. Feel free to talk to me afterwards if you're interested in learning more. Um, so the title of this talk sounds a little pretentious, I admit it. Uh, Scale of Asian Inference, Hamiltonian, Monte Carlo. Uh, it's for a reason. So um, I want to not just talk about Hamiltonian, Monte Carlo. I'm not going to get into too many details of the algorithm itself. I want to explain why Hamiltonian, Monte Carlo is important, why it's critical for doing the kind of statistical analyses that really arise in, in science, in industry, medicine, etc. So really the frontiers of applied statistics, um, those problems, why do we need this kind of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algorithm? In particular, this word scalable is thrown around a lot, and everyone uses it to mean something slightly different, usually you know, trying to rationalize what they're trying to do already. So I'm going to define very particularly what I mean by scalable, what that implies for the difficulty of doing Bayesian inference, and then how we can try to ameliorate those, those difficulties, and that will very naturally lead us to Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. So let me begin with the, the kind of problem of the, of the analysis itself. And of course, we're, I think we're kind of now riding a little bit of the crest of the wave, the zeitgeist of big data. Um, but still, people focus on the amount of data you have, the, you know, just the pure breadth of, of your data when, when determining the difficulty of an analysis. And unfortunately, that doesn't really characterize the statistical problem. If I want to analyze a data set, I need to know not just how much data you have, I need to know the kind of complexity of that data. What kind of model do I need to analyze that data efficiently? And in order to determine the, the difficulty, the, the scaling of a computational problem, I need to determine in which direction in the space I'm moving. It's fundamentally different 
to try to tackle a problem where the data science is, gr is growing, but the model complexity is not. Right, the kind of ideal IID case that you see in a lot of statistics and machine learning textbooks. It's fundamentally different to move up into having a very uh, limited data set, but the model complexity is growing. Something you might see in science as you try to go move, more to, uh, move to more precise uh, analyses. Something you might see in medicine as you go to precision medicine. And of course, there'll be complexities in the middle where as the data grows, the model complexity itself has to grow. Models where you have heterogeneity, it's fundamental to the data and there's no way to get around it. So in order to determine the problem, I need to determine where in this space I want to move, right? Which of these are relevant to the problems that I'm interested in. And there's a very nice decomposition, vocabulary if you will, kind of separates the two main approaches in these spaces. The first is what's called the tall data regime. And the tall data regime is characterized by having lots and lots of data that's simple and clean and pretty, right? Beautiful data that has no complexity to it, no systematic structure, no selection biases, just data that's coming in and tells you more and more about the things you care about. Now this is a wonderful regime because that data is so powerful, you have very little uncertainty. And the uncertainty that you do have is so nice and well structured that you can get away with a lot of approximations. So a lot of algorithms that you see being thrown around these days are really aimed at this tall data regime. But we also have this kind of complementary wide data regime on the other side of space. And the wide data regime is characterized by having more complexity than information in the data. So you can have a lot of data, right? Again, the data alone, does, the size of the data alone does not fully specify the problem. It's the data uh, relative to the model complexity. So I can have a huge amount of data, but I have more complexity in the model. I have more systematic effects. I have more structure that I need to model to be able to extract information accurately from that data. And I would argue this is the relevant domain. You might be here right now. But sooner or later, if you really want to go beyond the shallow inferences in your collected data, you're going to have to deal with these complexities. And you're going to drift sooner or later into that wide data regime. <coughs> so what I want to tackle as an applied statistician are problems in the wide data regime. And I want to build tools that will facilitate our doing analysis in that wide data regime. <coughs> now, I'm a Bayesian, which means I'm going to use Bayesian analysis to tackle these problems. And that Bayesian analysis is going to come with two main contributions on the modeling side. I'm going to have an observation model. This is the probability of observations given the, the kind of configurations of my model. Each configuration is a different story of how the data could have been generated. And I'm going to try to identify which of those stories are consistent with the observations that I've made in my data. Now, this observational model is where I include things like selection bias and systematic effects. This is where a lot of the complexity of the data is going to come in. I'm going to add to this a prior distribution. Now, the prior distribution can be very critical in these problems because the prior distribution gives me a principled way of incorporating domain expertise into my analysis. And this is especially important in the wide data regime because the wide data regime, remember, is characterized by not having enough information. So if I don't have enough information in the data, any information I can add in the prior, so long as it's principled and reasonable, can drastically improve my inferences. Right? So the Bayesian paradigm is very, very natural for these challenging Y data problems. So those two together give me a posterior distribution. And this posterior distribution characterizes everything I know. Right? You can think about Bayesian inference as kind of an information conservation game. What I know before. Now, what I know after I've collected my data is what I knew before I collected my data, plus what I learned from the data. Right, so everything's in that posterior distribution. More importantly, all of my statistical questions that I can ask take the role of posterior expectation values, meaning questions take the form of functions, and the answers come as expectation values with respect to that function over my posterior distribution. Right, so think things like means, variances, quantiles, Bayesian decision, th Bayesian decision theory, right? These are all expectation values. Anything that's on an expectation value is on a well-posed operation in Bayesian inference. And this is a really nice abstraction because it means Bayesian inference is really quite elegant, right? In a Bayesian analysis, I just have a modeling step where I specify the prior and the likelihood, and I have a computation step where I compute these posterior expectation values. That's it. That's all Bayesian inference is. That said, neither of those steps are easy. Specifying a good model is incredibly difficult. Right? You really have to understand your domain. You have to understand the statistics and then put them together in a meaningful way. Even once you have that model, 
computing these posterior expectation values is incredibly challenging. And that's what I want to focus on today. So we've specified this complex model. We have many, many parameters going into the thousands, if not tens of thousands of parameters, hundreds of thousands, really kind of no limit in that, in that direction. And I'm going to compute these integrals, these expectation values over those high dimensional posterior distributions. Now, because I just care about this computational problem, now I'm going to abstract the notation a little bit. So I'm going to kind of, kind of move past this posterior and just focus on a given target distribution. Right? So this is not a prior. This is the posterior. I've just kind of ignored the conditioning on the data. So I've now kind of considered a circumstance where you specified some distribution. You're going to come to me and ask me how I can compute expectation values with respect to that distribution. And that's going to be the goal, computational goal today. Now, why is this challenging? Well, for these kind of bespoke problems where you're going to choose the distribution, I can't manipulate the distribution to have any kind of nice mathematical form to let me to do these integrals analytically. Right? I'm going to have to rely on numerical integration, which is unfortunate because numerical integration is real hard. In particular, these spaces are so big, we're not going to be able to exhaustively search them. Right? If I wanted to put a grid down, and I wanted to have endpoints on that grid on every side, right, how many grid points would I need in, say, two dimensions? N squared, right? So if I'm going to need uh, N squared function evaluations to view any kind of numerical approximation using a quadrature approach, that's not too bad. But what about in 10 dimensions? It's N to the 10, right? If I want 10 grid points in every direction, that is an incredibly crude grid. That's going to give you a very bad answer. But that alone is going to require 10 to the 10 function evaluations. 10 to the 10 is too big of a number. Okay? We cannot think about numbers that big. So we need to be more careful, right? We can't just try to brute force exhaustively search these spaces. We need to focus our computation only on those regions of parameter space that actually contribute to a given expectation value. Which then raises the question, where are we actually getting non-trivial contributions? Now, one thing that we can realize is the integrand is going to be really critical here, right? If this integrand is 0, I'm not going to get any contribution to an integral. And the flip side of that is that if the integrand is big, I should expect to get a larger contribution to this integral. Right? Integration is a linear operation. The larger the integrand is, the larger the integral should be. So this implies a pretty simple algorithm. Let's run an optimizer. Let's go to the optimum of, of this integrand and focus our computation in a small neighborhood around that optimum. In fact, we can go one better. Because usually these functions, whose expectations we want to take, are pretty uniform relative to the kind of exponential tails that we see in posterior distributions. So going even further, I'm going to run an optimizer, go to the mode of this target density that's been provided to me, focus my computation in a neighborhood around that mode. Right? Sounds very similar to optimization, sounds very similar to map estimation, very similar to a lot of algorithms that I'm sure you've seen. Is this a good idea? No, it's a terrible idea. And we're going to see why. So the, the general story here, right? here's my, my high dimensional space. This is considered it's a radial di uh, direction. So here's my mode. And I'm going to move away from the mode. My density is going to fall off. So it seems pretty reasonable to focus my computation in a neighborhood around that mode. But when I do that, I forget something very critical. And that's that integration is not just about evaluating an integrand. It's about averaging an integrand over a volume. Right? This DQ is not just a notational device. This DQ is telling me something about how I have to weight those integrand evaluations. Right? I can have a very small value of the integrand, but if it's distributed over a very large volume, that's going to lead to a much larger overall contribution. If I have a very large value of the integrand, but it's concentrated in a very tiny volume, that's not going to lead to a very large contribution. Right? So I need to weight these two contributions. And unfortunately, volume does not behave the way we think it does in high dimensions. Our low dimensional intuition is going to betray us. So to see how that might be, let's build up some intuition of exactly what's going on in high dimensional spaces with volume. And I'm going to start very simple with a very simple one dimensional example. Right? So I'm going to take a, a, just a line, an interval, and I'm going to cut it into three. So that central black line, that's going to be my central mode. Right? That's that uh, neighborhood that I was focusing my computation on. And then I have these two side uh, uh, intervals. Now, 
looking at this, I'm not losing much by just focusing on that center, right? There's not that much volume that I'm ignoring. So it seems like looking at the mode is a reasonable approximation. But when I go to two dimensions and I use that same length scale to split up my space, I have the original two side neighborhoods. I get two more for the new dimension. That seems reasonable. But then I get corners. And it's the corners that are going to fundamentally cause the problems in high dimensional spaces. Right? When we move to a high dimensional space, not only do you get the kind of linear growth that we might expect, you get an exponential growth because of the amount of corners that you have. To see that in three dimensions, it's a little bit wacky, right? But here, what you want to focus on is you have corners, and then you have corners on corners. In four dimensions, you get corners, corners on corners, corners on corners on corners, right? The amount of corners grows exponentially, and that means the amount of volume that's not contained in that central little neighborhood grows exponentially fast with dimension, right? That should scare you. Exponentials are not something you mess with. Um, another way of thinking about this is in terms of a sphere. So I'm going to take my uh, any point, so say the mode. I'm going to look at a sphere around that point. And I'm going to ask, how much volume is immediately inside the sphere versus immediately outside the sphere? So here's my, the surface of my sphere. One dimension is just a plane. So I'm going to move inside a little bit, outside a little bit, and see how much volume is there. Now, in one dimension, it's the same volume. right? There's, there's no kind of difference inside or outside. But in two dimensions, I have more room to grow into as I move out, and I have less room to move into as I come in. Right? I get kind of compressed as I move inwards because there's nowhere to go. And so there's more vo volume immediately outside the sphere than there is immediately inside the sphere. And then in three dimensions, that difference of volume grows even more. So what you end up getting is the volume outside of a sphere, immediately outside of a sphere, is exponentially larger than the volume immediately inside the sphere. Right, so as you go to higher dimensions, you get exponentially more. And this is weird. Right? So the general kind of intuition here is that when you're in a high dimensional space, it doesn't matter where you are, it looks like the volume is running away from you. And as you go to higher and higher dimensional spaces, it's running away faster. Right? It's like you're at a cocktail party and you're socially awkward. Right? Everyone's just away from you and you don't know why. So it could be that you're socially awkward, or it could be that you're in a high dimensional space. I'm going to leave that to you to decide. <laughs> Whatever you need to rationalize your own feelings. I live in a very high dimensional space myself. <laughs> so the problem here is that while the density is concentrating around the mode, the volume is concentrating very far away from the mode. And I'm getting these two different contributions that are in tension with each other. The right abstraction here is not thinking about density alone. It's not thinking about volume alone. It's thinking about their product. Right? It's not just pi or dq, it's pi dq. That's what matters. That's what defines a contribution to an integral. And that pi dq, that probability mass that matters for our computational problem, it's not concentrating around the mode because there's not enough volume there. Right? It's not concentrating at infinity because there's not enough density there. So instead, it concentrates in the middle. And we call that neighborhood that it concentrates very roughly, very informally, a typical set. Right? So I'm not going to actually put a threshold down here and define this as an explicit set. I'm just giving some intuition as to where the probability mass is concentrating. And remember, this is a radial picture here. right? So this neighborhood is not just displaced away from the mode. It actually surrounds the mode. What you want to think about is all of the probability mass, all the regions of parameter space that are dominating the contribution to these expectation values are lying in a surface that surrounds the mode. So the right abstraction for high dimensional space looks something like this. And the other thing to keep in mind is that as you go to higher and higher dimensions, the tension between the density and the volume is going to grow. And the width of this surface starts shrinking real fast. So what we have is this the gossamer, this infinitesimally thin surface floating around parameter space that we have to somehow find and quantify. You try to throw darts at this thing, those darts are going to go right through. If I try to put a grid down here and systematically search for this, unless that grid is really, really dense, this typical set is just going to snake right through those points. I'm going to get a terrible approximation. If I want to construct a computational algorithm that can scale up to these high dimensional spaces and find these very thin typical sets, I need something that can actively search for probability mass. And that's going to be really challenging. Now, we do have one natural way of doing this, and that's with something called Monte Carlo. In Monte Carlo, we draw exact samples from our distribution. 
right? If you know, might be familiar with Python or R, you go to your pseudo random number generator, get a thousand Gaussian variates. That's an exact sample. And those exact samples, by definition, will concentrate in regions of high probability mass. If you can draw a sample, it will tell you where the typical set is. So what we end up getting is this series of approximations. I can't integrate over the entire space exhaustively because that's too expensive. So I'm going to approximate that by integrating over the typical set. I can't integrate over the typical set because I don't know where it is. But I can integrate over my samples. So I can construct what's called the Monte Carlo estimator by averaging the function whose expectation I want over those samples. And I get this wonderful estimator that has these beautiful properties. It's unbiased. So it averages out over the kind of samples that you draw to the true value, the true expectation value. And most importantly, it has a bounded error. We can quantify how good this estimate is. If you're doing probabilistic computation, I need to know how good your approximation is. Otherwise, I have no idea whether or not you're faithfully telling me what the model's trying to say. And in Monte Carlo, I can arbitrarily tune that precision by just drawing more samples. Right? I can quantify the error, and I know how that error behaves, which is really what makes it a powerful tool, or would make it a powerful tool if we could actually draw samples. So when was the last time you drew a pseudo random number generator from a you know, thousand dimensional distribution? Probably not common, right? So what you get are a lot of one dimensional distributions. And if you're lucky, you'll get a multivariate normal. Right? You can't draw a sample if you don't know where the typical set is. They're mathematically the same problem. They're equivalent. So I haven't found a shortcut. I haven't found a back door. Right? I've just put a mask on, you know, Scooby-Doo style, a mask on my problem, and thought it was different. But this gives us something to think about. Because I don't necessarily need exact samples. Even if I can't draw exact samples, I might be able to utilize this approach if I can generate samples another way. In particular, I have a means of generating correlated samples that might do just as well using a Markov chain. So a Markov chain is generated by what's called a Markov transition. It's a random map. It's this uh, t of q given q prime, which says that if I'm at q prime, where should I jump? Right? Give me, you know, say like a little kind of Gaussian noise, and I just kind of jump, get some more Gaussian noise, and I jump, and I just continue that on. Now, if I just take an arbitrary transition distribution, and I run it, I'm going to get some random walk through space. Right? Nothing useful is going to happen with that. But if I can engineer a Markov transition that preserves my target density, right? this is a deterministic equation that I can verify then something very special is going to happen to that probabilistic behavior of my jumps. If this condition holds, then no matter where I am in parameter space, the Markov transition is going to concentrate towards this region of high probability mass. And so if I draw a sample from that with exceedingly high probability, I'm going to jump towards the typical set. And at that point, same thing. So I can use this Markov chain to search and destroy. Right? If I run this transition over and over again, it's going to drift into the typical set. And it will, once it's there, just kind of latch on and continue to explore it. Right? The Markov chain is literally attracted to the probability mass. So I just let it go, and it will do the work for me. And if I run that Markov chain long enough, it will distribute across the entirety of the typical set. I can throw those initial points away. And now I have something that looks just like that Monte Carlo sample. Right? Just that kind of quadrature grid. It's stochastic and random, but it still gives me a quantification of this region of high probability mass. Now, what I get out of the Markov chain Monte Carlo is unfortunately a little bit weaker than what I get out of Monte Carlo. I get this asymptotic result. This is that if I construct this Markov chain Monte Carlo estimator, by averaging over those points, again, that approximates averaging over the typical set, which then approximates averaging over the whole space. When I run that Markov chain infinitely long, I get the true value. Now, this is a lovely result, given how hard this problem is. But unfortunately, infinity is a really large number. That's going to be a problem. Right? Computers are very fast these days. They're not quite infinite fast. And the issue with Markov chain Monte Carlo is that this guaranteed has been, doesn't give us any kind of guarantee on what the finite time behavior of the Markov chain is going to be. I can get arbitrarily bad finite time behavior and still get an asymptotically correct answer. And so the, the danger of MCMC is just deploying some arbitrary 
Markov transition, even if it has that invariance property that has terrible finite time behavior, I get an arbitrarily bad answer, and I'm not getting what the model is trying to tell me. So to dig in a little bit more and to get a sense of just how bad it can be, I first want to present what the idealized behavior is. Right? What, what do we typically think of MCMC behaving, but in the picture of this high dimensional space? So we'll do the ideal case first, then we'll go into the complexity of the pathologies. So here's my cartoon of the typical set on the left. And what I'm going to show you on the right is the progression of my estimator. So I'm going to have the error of my estimator on the uh, y-axis and the iteration, the number of iterations of my Markov chain on the, on the x-axis. So as I first explore, right, my Markov chain is finding the typical set. These initial points are not helpful. They are not in the typical set. They don't inform my estimators. And indeed, the error doesn't really change. So we can throw those points away and they have no effect on the estimator. If anything, they make it better. Once I find the typical set and make my first sojourn across it, everything is so exciting and informative that I get this rapid improvement in estimator error. Right? I get this kind of thresholding behavior. And then as I continue to explore, as I fill in the gaps of the typical set, I start kind of settling into the square root of n convergence, which looks just like the square root of n convergence we had in Monte Carlo. So under idealized circumstances, Markov chain Monte Carlo will converge and start behaving like regular Monte Carlo. We'll be able to bound and quantify the errors and use that to get a sense of whether or not we're, we're getting a kind of faithful representation of what the model is trying to communicate to us. Unfortunately, not everything behaves this way. Unfortunately, there are circumstances where you have regions of high curvature. And the problem with regions of high curvature is that most Markov chains explore with a certain characteristic length scale to them. Right? They're used to moving around at a certain gate. And if that gate is too long, then it's going to step right over this region. Right? I'm going to miss this neighborhood entirely. And what that means is I get a biased estimator in finite time. But somehow, after an infinite number of iterations, I have to be able to resolve this. And this results in some interesting behavior. So let's look at what the, this Markov chain looks like, or Markov chain looks like targeting this problem. So on the left, again, the typical set. In the middle, I'm going to show you the trace plot of this, of, of this uh, chain, so the, the vertical direction as we explore. And then I'm going to show you the mean estimator uh, of that, again, vertical direction as we continue to explore. This is now signed. So zero is in the middle. I want a zero estimate. That would be unbiased. And we're going to see if it's both positive and negative in terms of the error. So as I initially explore, the Markov chain is moving around these very nice and well-behaved regions of the typical set. And it looks just like a regular Markov chain. Nothing's problematic yet. But eventually, it's going to get close to the pathological region. Now, it knows it's there. right? It knows something wacky is going on. And it's kind of like you know, a drunk lad seeing their keys in a grate and realizing, wait a second, I could probably get that if I shove my hand hard enough through that grate. Right? Or depending on the amount of drinks, if I can shove my head into that grate. <laughs> and this Markov chain does the same thing. It literally freezes, stubborn, trying to force itself into that pathological region. Now what happens, it's a little more successful than somebody trying to find their keys. The estimator does correct almost as if you were exploring that region. But it's a very crude estimate. And very quickly, you overcorrect. And now you have a negative error. Right? So you're getting something that's all right. But very quickly, it's on the other side. Now, if I continue this process, it will release. It will eventually give up and move on. And the estimator will then come back up. And this process repeats. So in a circumstance like this, you don't get the nice clean convergence we had in Monte Carlo, or we had in the idealized MCMC world. What you get is an oscillating bias. So it's either really bad high, or it's bad low. It's bad high, it's bad low, it's bad high, it's bad by low. Infin after an infinite number of iterations, that delicately cancels. And you get the right answer. If I cut that off after any amount of, uh, finite amount of time, then I'm going to get one of these biases. Right? So having an asymptotic guarantee is not enough to trust your algorithm. You need to know what's going on after a finite amount of time. And that tur turns out to be very, very challenging. So what we really want is this mathematical property called geometric ergodicity. And it's not important that you understand what that means. 
It's just the magic word that means that everything is well behaved. If I have geometric ergodicity, then I can explore very efficiently. I get this central limit theorem, so MCMC looks like Monte Carlo. It's everything I want, and it's almost always never there for us. And this is particularly troublesome in high dimensional spaces when we have these intricate uh, models and we have these kind of interesting geometries, regions of high curvature that are hard to explore. And we don't know whether they're necessarily getting a good answer, right? Because the, uh, there's no mathematician who's going to show up at your door and offer to solve this problem for you. This is so hard that we don't really know how to solve this in a bespoke problem. So even if we had mathematicians for everyone, which would be kind of a fun world, it wouldn't be enough to solve this problem. So we need to think a little bit harder about how we build these Markov chains so we have a hope of getting a good exploration and ideally get a sense of whether or not we have these nice properties. So this goes back to how we engineer a Markov transition, right? I need to choose a transition that targets my distributions that are given to me, and I want it to be good enough that I can explore these high dimensional, very thin typical sets very efficiently, and it will tell me if I can't get complete exploration. So what I need to do is choose some kind of Markov transition that uses information about the target distribution. And one natural way of doing that is what's called random walk metropolis, something you might have seen before. This is the first Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, and it's typically still the one that you see first in classes. And this Markov transition proceeds in two steps. The first thing I'm going to do is generate a random proposal. So it's just going to be a jump, just an undirected guess at somewhere. Now, that undirected guess is going to uh, select out regions of high volume. Right? If I have a neighborhood with more volume, I'm going to jump there more. Uh, I'm going to prefer to jump there versus a neighborhood with low volume. But that's not doing anything about density. To take the density into account, I'm going to correct that proposal. I'm going to reject it if it jumps to a region where the density is too small. So what ends up happening in this two-stage process is I jump to regions of high volume. I reject anything that also happened to have jumped to a region of low density. So the only thing that survives this process are those points that are neighborhoods of high volume and high density, which is The typical set, right? This is what we're after. Markov chain Monte Carlo is not finding the mode. It's not an optimizer. It's finding the typical set. Now, the problem with this approach is that it's not going to work in high dimensions. So let's take a, a cartoon of this using our typical set intuition. So here's a point. I've already found the typical set. And now I want to apply Markov uh, random walk metropolis. So I'm going to uh, add a proposal, right? I'm going to jump around using this isotropic Gaussian noise. Now, what is isotropic Gaussian noise going to look like in high dimensions? Is it going to look like a sphere? So how much volume is outside the typical set versus inside the typical set? Remember the sphere example. Volume is always growing as we move away from the mode. And in high dimensions, there's going to be much, much, much more volume immediately outside a sphere than immediately inside a sphere, which means that our isotropic Gaussian kind of looks more like a spade. Right? Again, high dimensions don't care about you, and they are not trying to be intuitive. They will mess with you. And this is an example. And what this means is that if I try to run random aquatropolis with a giant step, because I want to move around really quickly, I'm going to reject most of those steps because they're all going to fall out here where the density is too small. What I can do to try to ameliorate that process is shrink the size of my step. And that gives me a much smaller jump. I'm still jumping away from the mode towards the outside of the typical set. But now, I'm not jumping far enough to actually leave the typical set. So I get a reasonable acceptance probability. So I'm not rejecting all of my updates, but I'm not going anywhere because now the size of my jump is so tiny. So it turns out it doesn't matter how you tune this algorithm, you're not going to go anywhere in high dimensions. Right? And this is a nice kind of cartoon of what's been known for a while in the MCMC literature. There's theoretical results demonstrating this, but it provides a cartoon to build some intuition as to what exactly is going on. Right? And the fundamental challenge is trying to guess and check Right? In high dimensions, there's going to be many more bad answers than good answers. So this idea of randomly trying something and correcting it isn't going to work. 
Instead, what I need is some directed exploration. I need information to tell me where to go. Ideally, I'd like to get some sense of where the typical set is. So if I start moving away, I can come back and kind of glide through the typical set. Right? And this is going to give me the kind of coherent exploration that moves me from one side to the other with as little computational effort as possible. The only question is how do I get this kind of information and how do I exploit it to generate these trajectories? And that's where Hamiltonian Monte Carlo comes in. A good half hour after the introduction. Right? So remember, I, I want to solve these Bayesian problems. They're going to be high dimensional. They're going to be complex posterior distributions. I need to compute expectation values of those, which means high dimensional integrals of complex integrands. And in high dimensions, that's very challenging because those integrals are all dominated by the typical set. And now I want to use Markov chain in Monte Carlo to move around that typical set, but I need something efficient to guide that Markov chain. I need some kind of Markov transition that can move through the typical set very, very quickly. So that's the motivation for HMC. So one natural way of giving me the information that I want is to literally lay down a set of directions. So if this is my typical set and I put out a vector field, which is just an arrow assigned to every point in my space, and I can align that set of arrows with the typical set, now I don't have to guess anymore. I literally just look at my feet, I see an arrow, it tells me where to go, and I follow that arrow. I get to a new point that's also in the typical set that also has an arrow. I don't have to look up, I don't have to think, I just follow the arrows integrating across the vector field and generating the trajectory that I want. Now this might not sound any better. I've gone from wanting to construct trajectories that go through the typical set to want to construct a vector field that's aligned with the typical set. But vector fields are easier to construct in general, and we have natural ways of constructing vector fields from our target distribution. Right? Remember, I want to somehow use the information about the target distribution to guide or build this Markov transition, and we have a way of doing that with vector fields. In particular, if I take my target density, and so remember the density is here in green. It's largest at the mode, and then it decays away. And then the typical uh, set is uh, surrounding uh, that mode. The gradient, the derivative, in a multivariate sense, of that density function is a vector field. Right? It's a vector field that at any point tells me how fast the density is changing. And that vector field is very clearly doing something that's aligned with the typical set. It's just kind of anti-aligned. Right? If I flow along the gradient field, I don't stay in the typical set. I fall out of it and go into the mode. But if I could somehow twist this thing around, if I could somehow take a complement of all of these arrows, and just kind of, you know, instead of doing what I'm told, I just do the exact opposite, then I would have moved through the typical set the way I want. And in hindsight, this isn't necessarily surprising. Right? The gradient only uses density information. But if I want to know where the typical set is, I also need some volume information. And it turns out that mathematically that volume information is what allows me to take the complement of those arrows, allows me to twist this thing around. And indeed, that's where all this differential geometry comes in. Right? So Eugene mentioned I do a lot of differential geometry, and it's to understand how to take a gradient and flip it around so it points along a typical set. Now fortunately for you all, I'm not going to talk about differential geometry. Because that mathematics that we would use also happens to describe classical mechanics, classical physics. So instead of talking about math, I can talk about physical analogies. In particular, instead of trying to reason about a mode, and a gradient, and a typical set, let's try to reason about a planet, a gravitational field, and an orbit. So now I want to take a satellite and put it into a stable orbit around this planet. And mathematically, this is the same problem. If I can solve the physical problem, I can solve the probabilistic problem. Now, because these are equivalent, they'll suffer from the same pathologies. And if I put a satellite in orbit and I let it free fall, what's going to happen? Go right? It's going to crash into the mode like before, only now it's a little more catastrophic. <laughs> can you hear the ah? <laughs> but the physical picture provides a way around this, right? We're pretty good about putting things in orbit. What are we missing in the physical picture to make this a stable trajectory, make it a stable orbit? Right? I need some momentum transverse to the radial direction. But I have to be careful in how I do that. Because if I add too little momentum, gravity is still too strong. And I still crash into the planet. 
right? I need to go a little bit further. But if I push too hard and I give myself too much momentum, well, then the satellite just flies off to infinity, never to be seen again. But if I'm careful and I add just the right amount of momentum, then the equations of motion that describe the evolution of that system, of this little satellite, are exactly the vector field that I want. And then the physical evolution is exactly the trajectory that I want. So if I take this physical intuition and I pull it back through this analogy to the mathematics, what I need to do to my probabilistic system is add some variables that look like momenta, that give me some, some force. And if I do that in just the right way, I should be able to take the gradient and convert it into something useful. And that is exactly what Hamiltonian Monte Carlo does. Right? Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is the unique way of taking a gradient and generating these flows through the typical set, through our target distribution. So a little more formally, this is going to get too bad. I just want to show you some basic structure. Um, I'm going to take my parameters, and for every parameter, I'm going to add a momenta. So I'm going to double the size of my space. And I need to add some probabilistic structure to these new parameters. Right? I start with a target distribution over my, my cues, my original parameters. And now I want to add some probabilistic structure to the momenta as well. And I'm going to do that by specifying a conditional for the momenta. So again, my target, and I'm going to add this new thing here. Now the reason I do this is because if I throw away the momenta, if I integrate the momenta out, I will recover my original system. So I'm, I'm what we call lifting up my original system. I'm bringing it up by adding more structure, but at any point I can fall back down and I'll go back to the thing I actually care about. And that'll be important in a second. Now that joint density that I specify, that has a very special property. That encodes the information that I care about. Right? The, density the density pi q, the target density alone is not sufficient, but when I pair it with this distribution for the momenta, it turns out that gives me everything that I want. So this is called the Hamiltonian function. And just for nomenclature's sake, this is comprised of two terms. So I have the log of a product, which turns into the sum of the logs. The first term here, the log of that uh, conditional density that's specified for these new parameters, I'm going to call that a kinetic energy. This is just following the, the physical analogy. And then the log of my target density, that I'm going to call a potential energy. So the potential energy is specified by my problem. I have to choose a kinetic energy to tell me how to move in my space. Now, no matter how I choose that kinetic energy, this Hamiltonian is going to give me a vector field. It's called Hamilton's equations or Hamilton's vector field. And it's going to have a little arrow in the parameter direction and an arrow in the momentum direction. And it turns out this vector field is exactly aligned with the typical set of this joint distribution. And there's a cool feature here. So the reason I went through all this math is I want to show you where the gradient arises. Right? Remember, V is our target density. DV dQ is that gradient we talked about before. The gradient is not acting on the parameters. The gradient is pushing the momenta. Oops. And it's the momenta that pushes the parameters. It's that indirect action of the gradient that does the flip and causes us, instead of going towards the mode, to move around the typical set. Now, the geometry guarantees all of this, but you see some hints and pictures that kind of confirm that intuition that we're building. So the overall algorithm looks something like this. Here's my typical set of my original uh, problem. First thing I'm going to do is lift up into my high dimensional space uh, by adding some momentum, by sampling from my conditional distribution. Once I'm on this larger space, I can now run these Hamilton equations. I can move and follow these arrows. And that gives me what's called a, a trajectory or a Hamiltonian trajectory. And remember that, that property that we had. I'm specifying a conditional. So every time I integrate the momenta out, I return to my original system. And what that implies is the shadow of that trajectory is going to fall on the typical set of my original system. Right? So I'm, I'm doing all of this work in this extended space. But the only reason I'm doing it, I don't actually care about what goes on in that extended space. I'm just pulling the shadow out. And that's actually giving me the exploration that I want. So at the end, I can stop at any point, throw the momenta away, and I'll fall back in the typical set. And if I integrate for a long period of time, I jump very far <coughs> relative to where I started. Right? So that's the basics of the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo algo. Now, there's lots more to do within that. I have to discretize those trajectories. I have to correct for the discretization error. I have to optimize all these parameters. But in general, it's going to give you something that looks like this. So here's a bunch of points I've already sampled. This is my current point. I'm going to build up a new transition 
by generating this trajectory. So you can see it's kind of growing dynamically. It's expansive. It covers the whole space. I'm going to pick a random point from that trajectory and go again. Right? So I'm not diffusing. I'm not limited to these small updates. These trajectories are allowing me to jump very far in my parameter space very, very quickly. And that's going to allow me to fill out the typical set with as little computational effort as possible. That's what's going to let me scale to these high dimensional problems. Now, this is all well and good if I could explore the typical set well. And we saw before that there's these problematic typical sets, these regions of high curvature that can obstruct simpler algorithms. Hamiltonian Monte Carlo isn't necessarily going to solve all these. Right? HMC is great. It's fast when it works. And it does work for a larger class of problems than competing algorithms. Right? It's pretty robust relative to other Markov chain Monte Carlo approaches. But it will still fail on a hard enough problem. But here's the really exciting thing about Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. When it fails, it does not do so silently. It is very whiny. So when Hamiltonian Monte Carlo tries to develop a trajectory that goes into that region of high curvature, it's not going to just jump right past. It's not just going to freeze there quietly. It's going to bounce off at a violent explosion. Right? Think of this typical set as a, as a kind of ditch. Right? And typically, you know, something like Random Walk uh, Metropolis is just a drunkard, just kind of randomly going back and forth, you know, correcting using the, the height of the ditch to make sure that they stay in the ditch. And they're going to slowly diffuse around. And if they hit some region of high curvature, they're just going to walk right past it. Maybe their foot gets stuck for a little bit, and they just move past. Right? But Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is like driving a car through this ditch. Right? Maybe a motorcycle to actually fit in a ditch. But you're going down at super high speed. You hit even a small little defect. You're flying. Right? Now, we're willing to sacrifice our Markov transitions because it tells us what is problematic. Right? This behavior is so unique to a failure, I can identify it and report it to you as a user, and you know something is wrong. So the thing that's really exciting to, to me about Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is, again, it works really fast when it works. It works on a larger class of problems than most other algorithms. And when it fails to work, it tells us. That is what makes it really powerful for a gener general toolkit. And that's the idea behind Stan. Oh, but first, uh, before I show you Stan, let me show you this movie here. So here is um, kind of a manifestation of that region of high curvature. So notice there's nothing down here. That's where that pinch was. And so if I run a trajectory that avoids that region of pinch, there's no problem. It looks like Hamiltonian Monte Carlo is running just as advertised. So I'm going to get one trajectory. I'm going to get a second trajectory. And now all of a sudden, I'm going to get a trajectory that tries to go into that funnel. And as soon as, as it tries to go down to that ditch, explodes, flies off to infinity. Right? That behavior is so characteristic, I can report that to you. And indeed, when that dot goes away, you'll see that it's green instead of gray. Because it came from that trajectory that diverged. And I'll just repeat this process over and over again. And every time I try to go down here, I'll get one of these green dots. And those green dots will concentrate in this pathological region that will tell me where the problem is. Right? Not only do I know that there's a problem, I know where the problem is. And that is incredibly powerful in a computational tool. So this is the basis of STAN. So STAN is, a, is an ecosystem. It's a platform. We're not quite sure what to call it. It's a bunch of C++ libraries that are exposed through Python and R, the command line, Stata, Mathematica. Choose your favorite. Somebody's written an interface for it. And the idea is that we're going to expose a modeling language, a probabilistic programming language, where you can build those complex models. Right? This is where you tell us what you want to fit, no matter how complex it is. You have a very rich language to do that. We're going to take that language. We're going to do autodiff. Right? We have a state-of-the-art C++ autodiff library that will compute those gradients for you. You will never have to touch a gradient calculation in your life. Quite lovely. You know, maybe on the weekend, for fun, you might throw one out there. But in general, we'll handle the hard stuff. And then we'll run Hamiltonian Monte Carlo automatically. We will tune and adapt the parameters automatically to try to achieve optimal performance. And then we will report these diagnostics. So you will not just get those samples out. You will get these diagnostics that are incredibly sensitive that tell you whether or not you can trust these results. And that's what makes Stan so powerful. Right? It's fast, yeah. 
Great, but it gets us the right answer. And if it can't give us the right answer, it will let us know, which informs we need to improve our problem. We need to change how we're collecting the data. It will allow us to iterate until we can get something that works. <coughs> so I'd just like to end with just a little kind of a philosophical note on, on the underlying geometry here. Right? As we saw in this cartoon, that when you go to high dimensional spaces, volume does weird stuff. And, and these probability distributions are really characterized by geometry. Right? They're characterized by a surface. And so in high dimensional space, the right way of thinking about a probability distribution is in terms of geometry. This isn't some cute coincidence. Hamiltonian and Monte Carlo working is not incidental. It's fundamental to the way these things behave as we scale to high dimensional problems. So Hamiltonian and Monte Carlo is already very powerful. It's already providing a lot of benefits for ap applied analyses. But as we try to push forward, this geometric perspective is really, I think, what's going to be the thing that persists. So we're improving Hamiltonian and Monte Carlo for developing new algorithms, thinking about geometry, typical sets, how we can work with typical sets, is going to be the thing that really pushes us deeper and deeper into the frontiers of applied statistics. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how we do questions. There's one over there. This is fundamentally not variational inference. Okay. So that's my second question. Yeah. What's the, exactly the difference? So in variational inference, so in, in MCMC, we're going to try to find a set of points that approximates a typical set. And we're going to basically do quadrature over those points. In variational Bayes, we don't deal with samples. We don't try to stochastically approximate the typical set. Instead, what we do is you have a family of approximating distributions, a, a bunch of possible things that might fit into that typical set. And you're going to look over those and try to find the one that is closest. And then when you want to compute an expectation value, instead of using your real distribution, you use that approximate distribution. So say in most applications, for example, you'll get some kind of Gaussian distribution or some kind of transformation of a Gaussian. So you're going to find the best Gaussian that fits your problem. And now if I want to compute a mean, I just report that mean of that Gaussian instead of the mean of the true distribution. Now the main problem with variational methods right now is that no one has any idea how close that approximate mean is to the true mean. So, so there's no error analysis on VB right now. And, so, and, and empirically, we've done a lot of testing, and it's real bad. It's not just like a little bad. It's very bad on low dimensional Gaussian problems. Right? That's not a good sign. So if in, in the kind of Bayesian analysis I'm interested in, right, I want to do precision analysis. I want to really get a handle on what my data is telling me at, a, at an intimate level. And I need accurate computation to be able to listen and hear what the model's saying at that resolution. So tools like VB typically don't work. They're not going to be able to scale, at least not right now. But you know, that might change in the future as we develop more methods. Sorry. Uh, one addition to that. Uh, that's up to the selection of the uh, approximate distribution, right? So it, it, it turns out right now the problem is not the choice of variational family. The problem is the optimization. So even within cho the choice of a variational family, most of the variational optimizers to find the best approximate distribution within that family are not very good. So there's some hope of proving that. But that, yeah, in general, you'll need a very, very flexible class of variational approximations. And there's a lot of attempts out there. But I will just politically say I don't think any of them are helpful. Yes, but when we talk about scalability, we're yes. not talking about the accuracy, although as a side effect of that. So when you talk about uh, scaling, you would like to do things fast. No. so so. So that's why, that's why I had that first bit about what I defined as scalability. Right? I'm conditioning on accuracy and asking, how can I maintain that accuracy as I push to higher dimensional problems? So my computational constraints, uh, my computational resources are a constraint. The accuracy is a constraint. And now the question is, how can I maintain that accuracy using just my finite resources as I push to harder problems? So when you compare variational approximation to the Hamiltonian uh, Monte Carlo, mm -hmm. uh, what speed? Uh, achievements, gains we get or lose in, in terms of accuracy as well, what, what we lose and what we gain? So the, the speed is, so these are very hard questions to say because they depend on the bespoke nature of your problem. 
And general VB is very fast, typically because it's cutting off the optimization faster than it needs to, like, too soon. And that's one of the reasons you're seeing a lot of bad performance. Um, but the, we can't quantify the errors, right? The only way we can tell if we're getting a good answer or a bad answer in VB right now is to run something like HMC as a baseline. So the kind of this principled, uh, approx this principled trade off compromise between how accurate it needs to be versus how much computation you get to spend, that's not something we can answer in a principled way right now. And with MCMC it is, right? I know how many iterations I can draw for a given computation and I know how accurate I'll be, be within that, right? If I need to get more precision, I know how much longer I need to run. I can make that decision in a principled way. I can't do that with VB right now and that's the challenge, right? I have no problem with faster approximations uh, that you know, have more error. I just need to be able to make that choice in a principled fashion and not just take what's given to me. Hello? Nope. Thanks, Michael. Excellent talk. Um, I was just going to ask if you could give us um, uh, any of the sort of exemplar problems that you think Bayesian is really a, uh, a better approach to go for than other kind of typical <coughs> machine learning or modeling techniques. Um, are there any kind of standouts where I don't even mention the wide data, but like in you know, a Actual yeah. What, what are the best ones look like? Um, so it, it's, I mean, I can give lots of examples. I can give a lot of fun stories and narratives of how Bayesian inference domain expertise have really helped us understand very challenging uh, analyses. Um, but I can also give a simple case, right? Let's say we want to do logistic regression, right? The, there's this very uh, strong push to do logistic regression over millions of data points, billions of data points, trillions of data points. But what does that give you, right? You're presuming that every observation that you're seeing it follows the same behavior, has the same slopes and intercepts. And even if you acknowledge there's a little bit of heterogeneity, the real question with something like logistic regression is when does that heterogeneity manifest? At what scale? How much, at what uh, uh, level of data do you start being sensitive? Can you start resolving those heterogeneities? And in most cases, even for small heterogeneity, it's like thousands of observations, right? So the question here is one of precision and one of domain expertise, right? So if I'm doing an A-B test, and I want to know which configuration is good. If I have domain expertise, Bayes is really powerful because I can already incorporate that from the beginning. But at the same time, it allows me to very precisely talk about you know, what kind of heterogeneity there is, incorporate those kind of systematics, and then get a sense of whether or not my model is good enough. So it's that flexibility in the modeling and the ability to, to really narrow down the challenge and then having the domain expertise to, to inform how you build that model. To the prior and the observation model. It's both of them, right? Because the, your domain expertise tells you if there's selection bias, if there's other systematic effects, other kind of biases in the data generating process that you want to incorporate. And is, is it generally um, Bayesian statistics is good for um, supervised and supervised sort of type of modeling? Type of modeling or um, or it depends on how you define it. Um, but it, it, it kind of yes, sort of. Um, if you're going to define uh, unsupervised learning as just clustering, then I will argue no one knows how to do that. <laughs> um, that's another, maybe a beer question. Um, but again, it, it, it has more to do with like, are you going to come in and are you willing to put the investment in to talk to the stakeholders, figure out what they want to do, talk to people who collected the data, you know, have them tell you all of the intricacies about how it was collected, work with statisticians to build that model and get a very precise pipeline that takes that data into something very principled with it. Right? That takes a lot of work and effort, but can be very powerful in cases where you, you know, it doesn't matter how much data you have, what you're trying to do with it is very, very critical. And the losses can be quite big. If you just want a black box, it's going to eat data and um, um, defecate insights, if you will. <laughs> um, then that's fine, right? Like, you know, if I want to, to capture an image, I don't need the whole distribution of, of captions that are consistent with an image. I just need one, right? So those kinds of engineering challenges where I just need an answer, I don't necessarily care about really quantifying the uncertainty about the answer, machine learning can be incredibly powerful, right? Um, and indeed, it's not necessarily a binary, right? I look at something like CompNet and I see a model. I don't see a black box. I see someone very carefully engineering a generative model of how the image is created, right? So there's definitely a kind of a, a niche in the middle and it's not, it's a spectrum. It's not really a binary. Uh, Yes, thank you for a very interesting talk. I, uh, when you speak of uh, lifting to a higher dimensional mm -hmm. space, my first thought was the fiber bundle, but I'm thinking now maybe it's what, yes. the fiber bundle. Yes, so, so anybody knows geometry, we're lifting to the cotangent bundle of the target uh, space, and then we're using that symplectic structure to form a Hamiltonian system, and then using the Hamiltonian flow on that system. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah, so you're absolutely spot on. All right, and then my, my second question is a little more detailed. 
uh, when you talk about uh, gravitational mm -hmm. orbits in a high dimensional space, yep. as a physicist myself, I was immediately interested in um, stability. Mm -hmm. Because in higher dimensions, gravitational orbits are not stable. Right. Um, but what, what, how does the stability work out? Um, so this is, this is actually a little intricate, right? So um, I'm going to give a, a, a detailed physics answer. I apologize. Um, you have energy conservation, so you're limited to a level set. And then you will get Hamiltonian chaos within that level set. So you're not really stable within that. You can infinitesimally perturb two trajectories on that level set. And they'll go you know, far apart very quickly. But they will stay on that level set. And it turns out for this kind of exploration, I don't care. All I want is exploration of that level set. All I want is convergence to the microcanonical distribution. Um, and so that Hamiltonian chaos arguably actually helps us. So it's the instability where we want it, but we get the stability on the level set. And you'll guarantee that the level set isn't going to shoot off into Yeah. So if we, if we start with a well-defined probabilistic system, the level sets are always going to be topologically compact. Um, and then the only question is, how can we discretize that to maintain that behavior? And that's where we go to the theory of symplectic integration, and we start getting things like divergences that are telling us when we're kind of switching the topology of the approximation. Uh, so yeah, all of that's, you know, can, we can show, we, get, we maintain that stability, and that's really what gives us the scaling. Okay, thank you. I like a great talk. I uh, really enjoyed that bit. <clears throat> Not a final word on differential geometry, mm -hmm. but uh, as I understand, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there is a higher incidence of geometrical pathologies that we transcend to higher dimensions. Am I correct? Um, so typically, the kind of things that people talk about on the pure math side are more kind of topological pathologies. Okay. Um, I mean, so on one hand, you know, the thing with high dimensional spaces is just more chances for things to go wrong. So there's more room for things to break. Right. And that's kind of what's happening in those kinds of arguments. Um, so in a case like this, is there more chance for things to go wrong? Um, yeah, but that's kind of a modeling problem. So we have to form, you know, uh, so uh, let me give you an example. So if I wanted to do a vector autoregression, so I want to do some time series model and I want it to be stationary. But now I go to a high dimensional space and I want everything to be stationary. Um, the, the kind of parameters that you use to control that stationarity as you go to higher and higher dimensions, no matter what prior you use, they concentrate on the stationarity boundary. And so they have all kinds of weird behavior. Things are never, it's very hard to keep that because of the high dimensional geometry. So that's a case where, yes, things are getting nastier as you go to higher dimensions, but we have to use our priors and our, our domain expertise to compensate for that, to have stronger regularization as we go to higher dimensions. So it's a little bit of, of, of kind of a tricky boundary there. So, so my point is I was not really able to wrap my head around the fact that, so Hamiltonian Monte Carlo mm -hmm. gives you an exit strategy in some sense. When you have a pathology, say that, okay, mm -hmm. it stops right there. Mm -hmm. How is it beneficial in that way compared to the MCMCs? Because so, so, to, so HMC is an MCMC, right? It's just right. within the class of MCMCs, it's, it's very powerful. But it, it's that knowledge. It's knowing that something broke. So you know that there's something there. And now you want to go back and evaluate your model and identify where is that pathology. And we can reparameterize. We can add better priors. We can add more data. Okay. And it's that feedback which allows us to iterate and improve our model. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. When, thanks for the talk. When you're looking at the typical set, mm -hmm. can there be multiple typical sets? Yes. Yes. And then the next question is, you mentioned how it sort of pings off. Would you yeah. then set the algorithm multiple times until you feel like you've covered most of those typical sets? Or is there a method for sort of approximating mm -hmm. what that will be? Yes. Um, so uh, if there are multiple typical sets, then indeed HMC will explore one of them, but it can't jump between them because there's that gap in the middle, right? It needs that connected region of high probability to follow. Um, you need global information to inform that jump. Um, and so HMC will not work. There are indeed generalizations of Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. There's something called adiabatic Monte Carlo that I've worked on that takes this problem, this idea of this geometry, and generalizes it to that. It's much harder. It's much more complicated. There's lots more uh, computational challenges. But it does kind of solve it in the same way. You get these trajectories. In fact, I can show a movie of it. Uh, let me see. So what it does is it starts with a, at a, a unimodal distribution. And then it's going to evolve the system forward to something that's multimodal. 
and that's going to connect those modes. So you can imagine kind of a single typical set here, and as the, the algorithm evolves, it's going to split that one typical set up into two. So now my trajectories can kind of transfer back and forth between them. So this is kind of a future algorithm. It uses the same kind of geometry, uh, same kind of approach, but it would te uh, technically allow us to handle those problems. Is, but the <laughs> way you motivated the problem was sort of in, um, if memory serves me correctly, like Cartesian space. Mm -hmm. Can you sort of transform your space and uh, get anything for free and things don't expand on you quite so quickly? Uh, no. So if you try to transform your space, say, to box and be like, well, I can avoid infinity by just putting things into a box, what happens there is you just concentrate on the boundary of that box really, really hard. So you're, what you're doing is you're taking all that stuff at infinity and just slamming it against the boundary. You're not actually moving it towards zero. You're just kind of slamming it towards that one end. Um, and that means that your problems are now almost worse because now you have those corners of the box to deal with. And you're, uh, you're, you're, you're not, you don't have this nice continuous thing to move through. You're really getting sh uh, shoved against that box. And then how do you even contain yourself in that box? So computation turns to be a much harder problem to do that. It doesn't make the problem go away. So think, think of these ideas as, in high dimensional spaces, volume concentrates on the boundaries. And in the case I showed you, that boundary was infinity. So it's just concentrating infinitely far away. But if you do try to put a boundary there, the, the phenomenon's still there. It's just going to be on that boundary that you've defined. So it could be a sphere. It could be a box. Thanks, thanks for the talk. Uh, I had a scenario where I was trying to fix synthetic data based on few assumptions, like uh, based on a target variable. I just uh, try to create a normal distribution mm -hmm. and a single dimensional Monte Carlo analysis. Mm -hmm. would, HMC would have worked though yeah. better over there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is the whole point of Stan. Stan would allow you to do that kind of analysis yeah. without having to write your own sample or without having to write your own, your, your own Gaussian library. You just write three lines of Stan code and then you can call Stan to get your samples out and do that analysis. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. I've used Stan before. It's great. Um, highly recommend it. My question was actually maybe uh, for how do you long short short? How does HMC work with reversible jump Monte Carlo? Does it, it doesn't. Does? It doesn't. So reversible jump is, is amongst the family of kind of discrete, fundamentally discrete problems that we don't have a gradient to inform. Um, I, I, I kind of bury the lead a little bit here. HMC will not work if you have discrete variables. And the problem is we, on a discrete space, we don't have the sense of gradient to inform us where to go. And there's this open mathematical challenge of can we define the kind of generalizations of gradients on these spaces that would let us move through, say, uh, a tree space, like a phylogenetic space or a graph space. Right? These are things that HMC can't handle right now unless you fix the topology. Um, and so those are open questions. Um, I, I would love somebody to solve them, but uh, right now there's, there's really nothing uh, being done. I think that's probably time. So can you please all join me in thanking Michael? Hi, Greg Pearl from Northbridge IT Recruitment. Um, just hope you enjoyed tonight's presentations. Uh, I've been sponsoring the Data Science Sydney Meetup for the last six years with regard to, to videoing all of the presentations. Just a heads up, if you're looking for any past presentations, please go to the Data Science Sydney YouTube site. There would be over 30 to 40 various presentations. I think it'd be good to, to go back and catch up on. Northbridge IT Recruitment, specialist IT recruitment firm, uh, working across government, uh, large corporates, and startups. Personally, I focus on the data area, specifically data science, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. If you'd like to speak to me about individuals who are looking for their next role, please reach out, make contact. Any organizations looking for their next data superstar, please give me a call. There's plenty of really good people out there at the moment and I'm very well networked in this marketplace, so I can definitely help. I look forward to seeing you at the next Data Science Meetup. Please don't forget, look at the uh, YouTube channel for those past presentations, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.